Well, good evening this uh, Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. On the road to Emmaus. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know that the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had even seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I don't know if any of you are cricket fans. Yes? No? No no former cricketers? No? Oh dear. Okay. So you probably haven't heard of the three W's then. Wall, Weeks and Walcott. In the great days of West Indian cricket, my father was West Indian, my mother's English, but my father was West Indian, and maybe that's where the love of cricket came, and it's tended to be the cricket, uh, the family, the family love sport-wise. But there were Barbadians, and somebody's nodding in the back there, yeah, and um, well known as brilliant cricketers, the three W's. Well, we're looking at three W's tonight, but not human cricketers. We're looking at the walk, the witness, uh, the um, wonder and witness. Walk, wonder, witness. Now this story, the Emmaus Road, is perhaps, in some respects, the most, you can't say the most exciting, but the most enigmatic of the 11 occurrences, um, appearances of the Lord Jesus post his resurrection, before his ascension. And Luke, who, as we know, Dr. Luke, he tells us right in the introduction to his gospel that he was very studious, he was very careful to give a careful, accurate history of what had happened. And here he goes into a lot of details. We start off in verse 13 there, and if you've got your Bibles open in front of you, it will help. That very day, which very day? The first Easter day, we would say, the resurrection day. 
we know that early in the morning that um, the women had gone to the tomb, the disciples, Peter and John had gone to the tomb, and they found that the tomb was empty, that the, that the body wasn't there. And we find these were two disciples. We've only told the name of one of them. Now, these weren't apostles. These weren't members of the 12, or rather the 11 who were left, of course, because Judas had gone. The 11 apostles. Remember, the Lord Jesus had many disciples. The word disciple means learner. Many people who followed him around, who listened to his teaching. Sadly, many who, John 6, when his, they were there for the miracles, they were there for the food, the feeding of the 5,000, etc. But the teaching was too strong. We read in John 6, from that time, many of his disciples no longer went about with him. Nevertheless, he had a lot. And these were two of them. And these guys were on their way to Emmaus, a village we're told about seven miles from Jerusalem. They may have been up in, up in Jerusalem for the Passover, they may have been witnesses at a distance of the crucifixion. We're not told. But they were on their way to Emmaus. And they were talking. J.C. Ryle, the Anglican bishop of the late 19th century, I call him the Anglican equivalent. He was to the Anglicans what Spurgeon was to the Baptists. And if you're not familiar with J.C. Ryle, then get hold of some of his writing or look them up. You can get them online. Absolutely excellent stuff. But um, he points out here that these two disciples were talking to one another. And it's very interesting what they were talking about. And he points out as Christians, do we, when we talk to one another, when we talk to other believers, what do we talk about? What's most of our conversation? How much do we share with one another about Christ? And also, of course, how much do we share with non-believers about Christ? And he points out that the example of these two um, picks that up. Interestingly, many years ago now, and only once, I preached on one of the 316s of the Bible that perhaps isn't so well known. Everybody knows John 316. Well, most people in churches know John 316. But... Go through the 316s. There are some great 316s in the Word of God. But in the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 3.16, reads this. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. In other words, our conversations are recorded in heaven. The Lord listens in. And what do we talk about? So often, I guess, after church services, people are talking, especially often in bigger churches, people are talking about the weather, they're talking about families, they're talking about holidays, anything but what's gone before. And then the next verse, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. Who? Those who fear him and talk about him. In that day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. But these disciples were talking, but they were disappointed. They were confused. They were despondent. They'd been discouraged. It wasn't, I suggest at this point, a happy conversation as they walked along. They were perplexed. They couldn't understand what they'd either witnessed or heard of happening. Everybody in Jerusalem would have known what had happened. They couldn't not know. Of course, because it was a Passover, the population of Jerusalem was swollen to many, many times its normal. And that, of course, the main event that weekend had happened three days earlier. That the Lord Jesus had been crucified. But while they were talking and discussing together, verse 16, their eyes were kept from recognising him. Who? Jesus himself. And the three things we read about Jesus here. Jesus himself. Now, what's the significance of himself? It's easy to just read scripture. And I'd encourage you, read it slowly, read it carefully. 
in the originals, every, the original manuscripts, every word is God-breathed. Every word's there for a purpose. The wording, the understanding, the meaning of it in the original, and the tenses are important. You see, why the emphasis on Jesus himself? He could have sent an angel to them. He could have sent, he could have raised one of the um, prophets and sent him to them. You remember at Caesarea Philippi, roughly six months before the betrayal and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, he was up in Caesarea Philippi, right up out of the north of, the, uh, uh, of Israel. And he turned and he went back down and spent six months get it going back to Jerusalem. But at Caesarea Philippi, he turned to the disciples and he said to them, OK, what's the news on the street? Who do men say that I am? And that's when they said, well, you're one of the prophets like Jeremiah, or maybe you're John the Baptist who's come from the dead. That's what people are saying. And he asked that pointed question, but who do you say that I am? No, it was the Lord Jesus himself who graciously drew near. He came to them and he went along with them. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. That's what the Lord Jesus does. That's what he's done to, for each and every one of us who know him, who know redemption through his blood, who name him as our Lord and Saviour and soon coming King. We haven't sought him. We were seeing last week with Jeremiah and we, um, we cross reference to Paul, for example, uh, who knew that before they were born, God chose them. And we said, we are each, every believer was chosen in eternity past and called in time through the gospel. Many of us love the old hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Jesus said, John 10, my sheep hear my voice. And they don't just hear in disregard. My sheep hear and they follow me and I give them eternal life, etc. And they shall never perish. Jesus himself graciously came to these despondent, these discouraged disciples. And he didn't just come and just kind of, okay guys, I'm here and disappear. He went with them. Isn't it good to know that in times of discouragement, times of depression, of despondency, times of illness, times when it seems the whole world is against us, time when we wonder what's happening in our society, what's going to happen to the people of God. The Lord Jesus is with us. What did he say? Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the, literally in the Greek, the age. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And so they were there, but, verse 16, the buts in scripture are important. I always say to people, when there's a but, sit up and take notice, because you've got a contrast. A point is being made, but... Despite the fact that Jesus himself drew near and Jesus himself went with them, their eyes were kept from recognising him. It stops us. That humbles us. That should humble us. That should stop us ever getting complacent or getting proud or getting to a point that we can manage by ourselves, that we can understand God's will, that we can understand scripture ourselves in the way that we might understand a scientific or a sociological and academic subject. Knowledge of God, knowledge of understanding of his word comes by revelation, comes by God himself, God the Spirit, revealing Christ in the word for us today. Their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, what are you talking about? What's this conversation you're holding with one another? When they stood still looking sad. I guess they were kind of, well, what do you think we're talking about? What are we likely to be talking about? Everybody's talking about this. Sure, who is this stranger who's not heard? You know, uh, they stood still looking. And he said to one of them named Cleopas, he answered that. He said, if, okay. There are thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of visitors to Jerusalem at this time. 
Can you possibly be the only person who's not aware of what's happened? That everybody's talking about this. Are you the only visitor who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, what things? I mean, by now, they must really be thinking, who on earth is this? Where has he been? And uh, he says to them, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. But notice what they knew of Jesus. What they understood of Jesus. They said, he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. A prophet, of course, they would understand, was somebody who God had raised up. God had sent with his word. God had spoken, revealed his word to the prophet. The prophet spoke from God to men. Men and women. And, um, this, well, this guy was a prophet. He spoke from God. Had they actually recognised at this time that the Lord Jesus was uniquely the prophet? Prophet, priest and king. The Messiah, Old Testament, New Testament, Christos in the Greek, Christ. Means an anointed one. He was supremely God's anointed one. Unique because he didn't just speak from God. He spoke as God, because of course he was God, the second person of the Trinity, or better, triunity, that we understand the Godhead to be. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But they recognised that this man wasn't just making up his own theories, or wasn't just repeating what one of the rabbis before had said, that what he said was coming from God. And a man mighty in deed. Well, of course, they couldn't deny the miracles. All oh, the Pharisees and the religious leaders tried to tone them down and tried to ignore them. But even there, in John 11, in some respects, if we try, and you can't say one miracle is greater than another, but if we analyse it from a human perspective, the raising of Lazarus, because Lazarus wasn't just dead, he hadn't just died. His body would have started to decompose. And they knew that he'd been risen, uh, that he was raised from the dead. But when you read John 11, isn't it shocking to see the depravity and the deceitfulness of sin that many of those who watched, and especially the leaders who knew this, decided they wanted, they plotted even more intently to get rid of Jesus rather than recognizing such a miracle, such as the blindness, unless our eyes are opened by God to reveal who Christ is. And so they recognised, though, that he was mighty indeed and mighty in word. We've already said that. Before God and all the people. But then you've got the contrast. But how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. They were sad. And they looked sad because they realised this was an injustice. They were probably angry but frustrated. They could do nothing about it. This had happened. No, this was their walk. And what a walk. But it was going to turn around. It starts off, you might think, negatively. But boy, how does the Lord Jesus turn this round? And um, you get this, of course, it reminds me there when they're talking about how our rulers delivered him over to be crucified. Of Peter's great <coughs> gospel test. Um, gospel serve a sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 22 men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know this Jesus how did you react to that you um, de de delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God God did this God wasn't caught out this was God's definite plan and purpose. That's why he came. But you, but he was crucified. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But, but, God raised him up. That's what we remember and celebrate particularly today. God raised him up, losing, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. But you've got a but again, verse 21. We had hoped. Oh dear, it's sad, isn't it? 
We had hoped. We don't hope anymore. Their hope had gone. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. In other words, the hope that he was suddenly going to get off the cross or suddenly walk out of the tomb early or not be buried, prove not to be alive, it had gone, whatever hopes they'd had. But what were their hopes? Again, we go back to Acts chapter 1, and we realise, I mentioned Caesarea Philippi, and following that point where Jesus asked him, who do you say I am, and Peter gave that great confession, then we find from that time, during that six-month period, Jesus began to tell the 11, or the 12, it was, Judas was still there. He told the apostles why, why he had to go to Jerusalem and that he was going to be betrayed and, the, and he was going to be crucified, lifted up, executed. But they didn't get it. The 12 at the time didn't get it. Neither did the wider group of disciples. And you find in Acts chapter 1, that um, just before the ascension, chapter verse 6, so when they come together, the apostles, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they were still expecting, thinking that he was the king of Palm Sunday, the one who was going to overthrow the Romans, the one who was going to restore the kingdom as it was, the empire under David uh, and Solomon's time. They only thought materially. We hear a lot these days, and a lot of um, churches proclaim dominion theology and kingdom now theology, a gospel which says we're going to convert the world, we're going to turn the governments to Christ, that the whole world is going to, go, going to be a mass revival and a turning to, back to the Lord. That's not what my Bible teaches. Rather the opposite, that dark days and darker days are coming before the Lord returns. No, what did Jesus famously say to Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world. So these disciples were just as confused as the others. That's why their hope had gone, because they had not understood that he was going, that Christ was, and had told them that he was going to be raised from the dead. Besides all this, this is the third time. Moreover, they'd had witness. Some women amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. They didn't find his body. They came back saying they'd even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Well, hang on, guys. Were you assuming that these women were just kind of, this was just wishful thinking, that they were just making this up to try and make them feel better? You had already been told, but you didn't believe their testimony. And also, more than that, um, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see him, they didn't see Jesus. Verse 25, this is where Jesus rebukes them. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Have you not understood the Old Testament? Have you not understood that before the, the, the Messiah, the Christ, reigns, and his kingdom's inaugurated. He had to be the suffering servant. He was going to suffer and die. Have you not understood the scriptures? And clearly they hadn't. Was it not necessary that Christ, the Christ, the anointed, God's anointed prophet, priest and king, should suffer these things first and then enter his glory? Clearly they hadn't. But now, you see, the walk starts to change. The walk now becomes the wonder. Why? Isn't this a sermon, a Bible study you'd love to have been at? There's been none like it. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. In other words, he went to the Old Testament. Do we recognise that the Old Testament is not just about the Jews? A lot of folks kind of make a big division between the Old Testament and the New and kind of say two-thirds of our Bible, the Old Testament, isn't relevant to us. We're the church age. We start in Matthew. No, we don't. You don't really understand the New Testament, as these disciples don't, if you don't understand that the Old Testament is all about Christ 
pointing forward to him and predicting uh, his work and his coming. And you don't understand the Old Testament as they didn't, unless you recognise that also, looking forward. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted, that's a strong word in the Greek, it's the same word that's used in, I think it's Acts 9, talking of Dorcas, where her name is, Luke says, her name's Dorcas, translated means. In other words, it's precise, says Luke, that he was precisely sticking to the scriptures and explaining the scriptures. That's what we have to do. Those of us who preach and teach formally have to make sure and should be only, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, giving the plain statement of the truth. He accurately, it couldn't be anything less than accurately, could it? That God himself, revealing his word and himself in the word, the things concerning himself. Now, it was getting near to Emmaus, it was getting near to the village, and Jesus acted as if he was going to go further. And they urged him strongly. Again, it's much stronger in the original. They constrained him is probably a better word for that. The implication is that they, you know, they almost got hold of him and said, no, it's late, you must. We want to hear more. We want to hear more. Is that your, when you hear God's word, when you hear God's word preached, or when you read God's word yourself, do you want to spend time, do you get enthusiastic? Do you have this hunger and appetite and you say, I want to hear more. As far as I'm aware, Christine will correct me, I think there's only one, uh, uh, one church where I was preaching. And, you know, you, every preacher wants to hear, if you say, well, time is gone, I'm going to have to, and they say, no, preach on, brother, don't worry about the time. Only one church that happened in. But these, these two disciples, that was their attitude, that was their approach. We want more. They tell us why. They said, stay with us, it's towards evening, the day's far spent. And Jesus graciously did. You see, if we're hungry for him, if we're hungry for his word, for his presence, he's not going to reject us. The problem is, an old preacher once said, we can have as much of God as we want. And here they wanted, and Jesus satisfied them. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then verse 31, their eyes were opened. And they recognised him. They recognised him, why? Because he revealed himself to them through the scriptures. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it. Their eyes were open, they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. And what was their reaction to that? Wow. Many of us have suffered from heartburn at some stage. It's not unusual. Physical heartburn. But they had the kind of heartburn we want. You don't want physical heartburn. But spiritual heartburn, yes. And look, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Have you had that feeling? Do you know that feeling? It's exciting. Something the world cannot know. The world goes after excitement and, uh, uh, and worships anything and everything and celebrities and sport and drugs and alcohol and travel and goodness knows what but this is something that they they just don't know they can't have their hearts burned while he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures yes their walk had become the witness of the lord jesus christ about himself uh, the wonder rather of the lord jesus christ and this was their wonder as he spoke to them but then it became to witness they found the eleven and those who were with them. We know that the eleven, the apostles, were hiding away for fear of the Jews. Understandably. Because once the Jewish, the, 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 the Jewish leaders had managed to get the Romans to crucify and get rid of their leader, they were likely to want to come after those who were with him and get rid of those as well, to squash this blasphemous new religion as they considered Christianity to be. And um, they were hiding away. But these guys, they went to them and they said, the, they said, and they gathered together, said, the Lord has risen indeed. And it's a bit of time. Then they told what had happened on the road. You see, how is it that so many of us today 
are reluctant to witness. We're reluctant to testify. Is it because we've lacked the wonder of the walk with the Lord? Why is it that so, t- so many today are kind of closet Christians? God doesn't, just the same as he didn't send an angel to these guys. He doesn't use angels to witness to the truth of the gospel. He doesn't use other means. He uses you and me. Frail humans who think we can't speak. We saw last week, like Jeremiah, I'm only a youth, I can't speak. Like Moses at the burning bush, or following the burning bush, I, I can't speak. If we think we can speak naturally, we're not going to be very effective for God. But when you speak for God, he speaks through you. He gives the enabling, he equips, he engages, he empowers. And these guys now, far from being kind of slinking away, downcast, now they couldn't help but tell and witness. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Shortly, we're going to gather around the Lord's table and break bread. But I want you to just go take away the three W's. Not three famous West Indian Barbadian cricketers, but that, that walk, that walk where the Lord Jesus drew near himself and went with them. And that wonder that came out of that, wow, our hearts are burning because God's word has come alive. So often God's word can become a drudgery to us. We can kind of feel we do a, have a quiet time because it's, uh, it's legalistic. It's kind of, we feel guilty if we don't. We need to ask the Lord to give us that real enthusiasm for his word. Because once you have that enthusiasm for his word, you want to share it and he'll give you opportunities to share it. And this is what happened with these guys. And their witness, they couldn't hold it in. They couldn't keep it to themselves. Just as we come around the Lord's table, and I'll just add this now because we didn't read on the next few verses. But as they were talking, Jesus himself, verse 36, notice, it was Jesus himself, stood among them and said, peace to you. They were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Even after the witness that they'd had from these two guys, wow. And he said, why are you troubled? Why, is, why are you doubting? See my hands and feet. It's I, it's me, touch me. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. And he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still were disbelieving for joy and were marvelling, their heads were all over the place. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him some fish and he ate it before them. And then again he said to them, as he said to the two on the road, he said to the bigger group now, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. But you see, we come to verse 45. Just as he opened the eyes of the two on the road to Emmaus, now in Emmaus he's opening the eyes of the bigger group, the apostles and those who were with them. He opened their eyes, to their minds rather, to understand the scriptures. Isn't God gracious? Just as here the Lord Jesus was gracious to open their minds to understand. If we seek him, if we seek him in his word, seek him in prayer, he will open our minds. He will not turn us away. Ask, seek, knock. And it's keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Our Heavenly Father will give us his Holy Spirit. will open our minds, increase our understanding, increase our fruitfulness and our usefulness, increase our love for him and the love for his son and for his people and for the lost world. And you have it. And you are witnesses, he said. He said, he says, thus is it written, the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise, rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We could spend a lot of time on repentance. 
It's a forgotten word or concept these days. You see, the Lord has to open our minds because the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Meta, change, noia from gnosis, the mind. The action, the change of action follows the change of our thinking, the change of our mind. That's why God speaks and that's why faith comes through hearing the preaching of Christ. We can't sidestep. The people say, oh, forget preaching. Nobody will listen these days. We need signs and wonders. Well, I don't need to tell you that signs and wonders did not convert people. No, it's the entrance of the word of God, God's word, that gives life. Therefore, we have confidence. And our prayer should be, Lord, speak. There's an old I think, I can't remember the words, but Lord, speak through me. And the idea is that use me to be your witness, to speak to others. He says, you, that forgiveness of sins, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You change your mind first. And then you believe in, you trust in, and keep trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Should be proclaimed in his name, the name of Christ, to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Brothers and sisters, whether you're sat here in this building tonight, or whether you're watching this on YouTube, wherever you are, this country or around the world, then let me encourage you. This Easter, Christ is risen. And Christ is in glory. He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And he's going to return to put an end to this sorry world. There'll be no more sin, no more death, no more pain, no more crying, no more sorrow. For those who have repented. Those who have asked for forgiveness. And those who are believing into, trusting in Christ. That he died for their sins. That he paid the penalty. That we are now counted not guilty before God. And we will be in his eternal kingdom of joy and bliss. Amen.